Good morning, everyone. Um, so my name is Richard Price. Um, I founded a company called Academia.edu, which um, <laughs> is a platform for academics to build a brand for themselves online, share their work, uh, connect with colleagues. We have about 3.3 .3 million academics who signed up. About 13,000 jo academics join each day. And each month, we get about 8.5 million monthly visitors. So um, I'm going to be talking in this talk about uh, where peer review is heading and different ways in which peer review gets manifested in the academic community. And I'm going to be talking about like various different dimensions and how the internet has made an impact on each of those. So I think um, at its heart, peer review is about extracting um, sentiment from the academic community, finding out what people think um, about a piece, of, a piece of work. And that can help drive, like a couple of main use cases are driving discovery, so what should I read, what should I base my own work off, and then driving like ranking sort of use case where you're in a committee allocating a job or a grant or some kind of resource and you have to rank candidates in a sort of like objective and fair way. That's not what happened when you were out of time. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to be talking about um, those two use cases, the discovery use case and the ranking use case in the context of a, a variety of peer review metrics. So citation metrics, um, these are ones that have you know, emerged online relatively recently um, and there are a number of like services like Google Scholar and Microsoft Academic Search and Web of Knowledge and so on that have focused on bringing some data mining that literature and um, in some fields like physics the citation count, a kind of like a global citation count for all the citations that have inbound to your research portfolio has actually emerged as a dominant peer review metric, um, which is quite interesting. So commenting or, you know, I sometimes call this like qualitative peer review. This is uh, writing sort of rich, thoughtful comments about a paper in response to it. Um, this is very much still the preserve of journals. Um, and a number of startups have tried to do commenting online, but the internet just has not succeeded at this yet. Um, there are a gazillion dead bodies in the space around commenting online on papers, and it's fascinating to explore the question why. I actually firmly believe, and I'm going to talk a, bit, a little bit later about how we can solve those problems, because I definitely think they are solvable. I don't think there's something intrinsically wrong about the internet for commenting, but it's just been a challenge. So it has not, the internet has not um, impacted this yet. Recommendations. Um, so this is, I think, um, probably perhaps more about the discovery use case and the ranking use case because they're quite hard to metricize at the moment, and you need like metrics to do rankings. Um, but you know, like people sort of share recommendations of papers over lunch, like what's cool and what's interesting, or send them over email or Twitter or Facebook or you know any other communication platform. And I think that really is actually a huge driver of, of peer review for in the discovery use case. Um, it's probably a little bit of a driver as well in the kind of like the what I call the resource allocation use case of like allocating jobs and grants, but it's much more informal. And um, the other, another interesting category of peer review that people often don't don't focus on so much, but I think it's actually really important, is person level peer review. People talk about article level peer review and journal level peer review, but actually person level peer review is really critical. Like people just getting evaluated as individuals, and that gets manifested like. Like the icon at the top left there is letters of recommendation, and that's a huge part of kind of the ranking process in a grant scenario or a job scenario. Um, what institution you're affiliated with is a huge is a huge signal, um, and um, you know how how many grant how much capital you've raised as an individual can actually be quite an interesting signal. People I know people in pharma companies, pharmaceutical companies, when they're evaluating and trying to find like what they call key opinion leaders, they often try t they often use like grant money raised as a, as a proxy for for, for um, like how much of a key opinion leader someone is. So it's a kind of a peer review metric. And then like these kinds of startups up here, Academia Mendeley ResearchGate, are all trying to build networks of researchers and have thi like things like follow accounts and contact accounts and so on. And you can use those follow accounts as a proxy again, just like you can on Twitter for you know how much someone's audience is and um, and so on. Um, so th the main bread and butter of Academia.edu, and I think this is you know I'm going to let Jan speak for Mendeley and ResearchGate's not here, but like I I would broadly placed in, in, this, in this space as well, is providing audience metrics to, to academics, giving them a set. If you talk to, I don't know, a researcher at Harvard, a professor at Harvard, and he's got 200 papers or 300 papers, and you know, 
you say, how many readers did you have last month? Like, what was, tell me about the usage of your research portfolio last month. They, they would love to know the answer to that question. It's just like the base level kind of like impact metric is how many people has my research touched. And those metrics are, the internet has definitely made an, quite a significant impact here. Uh, those metrics really are coming online as people share their work on, on sites like Academia and, and Mendeley and ResearchGate. Um, and they're also starting to drive um, uh, these sort of ranking decisions or these resource allocation decisions, and they're playing a role in, in, in tenure decisions and, and grant decisions. And I'm, I'm going to show you a few kind of um, anecdotes from our users. We track this really closely um, about how many people are looking at our analytics dashboard and how many people are sharing the analytics dashboard in academia with their tenure committees and what the tenure committees are saying in response. And I'm going to share with you a few anecdotes. But this is, like the, this is how our dashboard looks. Um, or one of the pages. It's actually quite a sophisticated application. It's quite, it's, you can do quite deep analytics on, on who's reading your research and how long they're reading it for and so on. And um, so you can see the sort of traffic to your page and what traffic sources are. You can see what countries are driving traffic to your page. And this is actually a really key and interesting thing for academics because one of the checkboxes in tenure review is often, um, do you have an international reputation? So that's quite a nebulous concept. I mean, how do you even, like... How do you tackle that? How do you prove that you have an international reputation in a kind of way that just slots into a, 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 a tenure portfolio pack? And you can sort of, people often print out these, um, sl these, we'll just take out screenshots basically, you can also export the data and you include it with your tenure portfolio and people are really using these audience metrics to just like, of course I have an international reputation and this, this is of mine, it goes on for pages and pages actually just for the last 30 days of two visits from, you know, the Vatican City and the three visits from Bosnia and so on. So it's, it can be quite interesting. So here's a professor of medicine at Moral University who, um, who, who is actually sits on tenure committees. So she's on the other side of the fence. And she says, I highly recommend to all the junior faculty a mentor to create an academia profile, but also to use the analytics and just print the pages out and use them as supporting evidence in tenure applications. Now switching to the other side of the fence, this is a guy who was applying for tenure a professor of psychology in the University of Limerick. Um, he wasn't. A t he was. On, he was tenure track initially, and he, he he was considering, or he did in fact use his academia analytics in his tenure portfolio. Um, and he says, the more evidence I demonstrate of impact, the more likely it is that the tenure committee will realise the different ways in which impact can be shown. Um, and the uh, the analytics, these audience analytics, prove that the the work that the university funds actually gets read and looked for, and so on. And and that can be helpful. Oh, yeah, this is uh, another someone in a similar kind of use case, actually, someone who's up for tenure. And again, she's, um, she's saying, I have a road to forge to show, my, um, show how uh, the contribution of modern, she's a librarian, the contribution of modern librarians is, is being measured in different ways. And an academic analytics are instrumental in that respect. They give a, a, paint, a very clear picture of what she does. So what is driving um, you know, all these like, new metrics that are emerging, like citation metrics, which didn't exist until a few years ago, at least in a kind of like a machine, you know, it's e easy, easy to collect away, or these audience metrics, or the follower counts? Well, I mean, part of it is just, um, you know, the fact of the matter is, obviously, that academic activity is moving online. Everything's, you know, communication activity, all kinds, is moving online. So it becomes easy to sort of data mine that activity, and metrics just emerge organically out of that sort of behavior. There is a second use case, it's a second sort of driving force, which is slightly orthogonal, which is it is just so tough in the academic world right now getting grants and getting jobs. And the success rate for an NAH um, grant application right now is 10%. So you're very, very incentivized as an academic if you want to stay in the game to, um, you know, to, to find some way of standing out from the crowd. And that's the main reason we see our users um, going beyond the normal ways of demonstrating their impact, i.e. just listing you know, their papers on a, on a resume. Um, but they want to sort of go the extra mile and say, yeah, take their citation accounts from all these different services and take their audience metrics from all these different services and do, do as much as they can to sort of s address, you know, speak to their impact in different forms. OK, so where, where are we going? That's kind of the survey of where we are right now and where are we going from here. So I mentioned like um, recommendations, and 
I said that like they do ha obviously happen informally over lunch and things like that, but not in very sort of structured, data mineable kind of metricized ways. But I do think that's going to happen. I think more and more people will be sharing on platforms like academia.eu and other sites what they're reading and what they're recommending, and then you can start aggregating those and you can see what is you know that this is a Nobel Prize winner in chemistry last year, Robin Lefkowitz, Robert Lefkowitz, and. You know, you, you could sort of see, you know, you could find all the top chemists that you really like or the top linguistics professors that you really like, and you could be seeing what they're reading. That'll help drive your own um, discovery of research, but also uh, you'll be able to see how many papers, you know, which papers have been most recommended by the top researchers. So I think metricization is coming to this space. So the common thing use case is really interesting. Like, why are there so many dead bodies in the space? Why is it pr proved so intractable? Um, I think that if you ask most academics, like, why don't they comment online on papers, they say, because it's a waste of time. I mean, it's just like, it takes a, half a day to, to put a comment out there that I'm happy with, and it's a half a day better spent on doing something else, like writing a paper which I'm actually going to get credit for. And I think that's the, the, the core thing to solve is the incentives problem. And I, I, mean, I think that, the, you know, where, um, can you, Jason, I, I'm conscious of time. Can you just give me a shout? I, I have, time goes in a very, you sort of pass yeah, the very straight. Okay, cool. Um, so, I think that the, the, the dream here with commenting online is to get to a situation where if you're a mathematician reading a math paper and you see a theorem that you can just refute straight away, you just know it's wrong, you should be racing to get that comment out by 6 p.m. today because you'll collect all this glory associated with it. And um, you, know, you will get credit for that, that contribution. To, this, to the academic literature. Right now, you don't get credit for it. You get, might get a lot of eyeballs, but that credit doesn't get you know, metricized in, in a way that you can actually take to your tenure committee or your grant committee and you know, show that that was a half a day well spent. Um, so I think we need to get to situ a situation where those, incent those, cre those comments really are incentivized. And, um, and there are a few startups working on that. I think we will crack it. Another prediction, I think citations um, will, will probably just switch to being just hyperlinks, just like an aspect of the web in general. I mean, I think that as scientific con content moves to become, to become web native content, we'll move beyond the era of where the PDF was like, you know, the, the, the dominant sort of content format, and we'll move towards a situa situation where, you know, content is written in, in web native standards like HTML, and then just the link just arises naturally out of, as a way of linking to other content types out of that sort of format. And I think that, yeah, you'll be linking to, um, you know, things like data sets and videos and images and blog posts. And there won't be questions about, like, right now it's actually one of the things holding back uh, things like, you know, the sharing of data sets is that people get really perplexed. How do you cite a data set? You know, and it becomes challenging. How do you cite a blog post? How do you cite this and that? And I think that when we move to just a more sort of uh, a, a form of linking, it's like the hyperlink, it's, it's much easier to... To get the, to build those connections, maybe linking to a part of a paper like a specific theorem. I think readership metrics will get more sophisticated. You better see like how fast along in your papers people have got, like which paragraphs people are dropping off at, and you'll be able to have a, just a really deep understanding of like how your how your content's being consumed. I think that you know the web is just this amazing kind of creative place where these new interaction formats are emerging all the time. And like GitHub, for instance, has this concept of forking, where you can fork someone's code base, and you can say, "I like this, but I want to tweak it in my own direction." In my own use case, I'm going to, you know, um, I'm going to stand on the shoulder of giants. But I'm actually instead of just like citing it or whatever, I'm actually going to like literally use that code base, but just take in my own direction. Um, Foursquare has a concept sort of checking, and obviously Pinterest has like other interaction formats like repinning. So I'm really, I'm pretty confident as this ac academic activity moves online, new kind of interaction formats will emerge, and and then th those will give rise to new peer review metrics. People often ask me things like audience metrics or even citation metrics, like how do you distinguish um, just popularity, you know, from actual impact. Um, and it's a really good question, um, like a, the fact that a paper's got a lot of views or a lot of citations. It might be, it might be that another paper has got half as many citations, but the citations are from like much more prestigious academics than the first, the first paper. Um, and I think the way to solve that is really how Google has solved this problem for links on the web is to you know make the algorithm recursive and. Um, 
and uh, you look basically at who's citing your work or who's linking to your work or who's reading your work. And I think that basically every single peer review metric I've talked about, recommendations, citations, um, audience metrics, comment metrics, these are all you know, susceptible to a kind of building in recursiveness. Thanks a lot. I love comments on this stuff. Um, this is a work in progress for me. I mean, I'm trying to think about these questions for, um, <coughs> for, for academia.edu, and um, so I can't wait to hear your questions. And if you have specific comments and you want to email me, um, I love hearing about this stuff. So tweet me or email me. <laughs>